apologize for my total lack of Spanish. Um, having worked in Washington Heights in New York for uh, more than 30 years, my Spanish is still just limited to Obre la Boca and Traga el Tubo. So, excuse me. So, I'm going to talk on uh, why the underdiagnosis of celiac disease. Now, overall, it's considered that celiac disease affects about 1% of the population. And this mainly comes from serological screening studies in which tissue transglutaminase antibodies uh, are noted to be positive and then confirmed by a positive endomesial antibody. And you can see in these studies um, that it's about 1% all around the world. Adults and children in the UK, adults and children in Turkey. The highest rate in the world is actually in this North African refugee population in which about 5% of children have bona fide celiac disease. Um, so that's when you go out to the population and you test them. Um, and it's men and women, about 1%. In some countries it's higher, like in Scandinavian countries. In Mexico City it's higher than 1%. And in other countries it's lower, like Germany has a lower rate. But it's men and women, adults and children. Now, um, we really don't know what it was like in the United States. However, um, about five years ago in the NHANE study, now this is the, the National Health uh, Examination and Nutrition Survey that, in which they involve about 5,000 people every year. And so if you have your bone density done uh, in the United States, uh, it's compared to the national standard, which is based on this NHANES. So five years ago, they asked um, these people, do you have celiac disease as doctor diagnosed, or are you on a gluten-free diet? And then they tested 10,000 serum samples. And overall, 0.7% of the population were considered to have celiac disease. And amongst whites, Caucasians, it was 1%. However, only 17% of that 1% were aware that they were diagnosed. Now that's one of the lowest rates of diagnosis in developed countries in the world. The highest is in Finland, in which 70% 70, 70 of the 1% are diagnosed. And in other countries such as Australia, Italy and Ireland, it's considered to be about 40% of the 1%. So there's this very low rate of diagnosis of celiac disease. And interestingly, in that study, none of the children that were positive uh, had been diagnosed with celiac disease. What's a little bit ironic uh, was that about the same rate of people, 0.6% of the population were on a gluten-free diet without having celiac disease. Um, so we were interested in looking at what are the factors responsible for this low rate. So we merged our pediatric and adult database and uh, to have a look at the ratio of gender uh, di in the diagnosis because as I mentioned, it's 1% of men and women, but women get diagnosed about threefold more commonly than men. So if you look at this graph, in childhood, um, it's about 40% are males, and in the older group, it's nearly 60%. But in these young adults, only 14% are men. And this is actually a study that's um, important because there's data that celiac disease has an increased mortality especially in men. So um, overall it's men and women, but females are consistently diagnosed more. Now why could that be? Well, women see the doctor more frequently than men. Women appear to have this compulsory healthcare system called gynaecologists, that if they don't go to the gynaecologist, they get a letter. Whether that alters their lifespan, I'm not quite sure. Women have more symptoms than men, and we know that for IBS, for sure. And women have more autoimmune diseases. It's three to one uh, for females getting autoimmune disease. 
but we know that men die uh, younger than women. Um, and we've, we've re certainly reported that men, when they get diagnosed with celiac disease, are sicker. So I think physicians should consider a diagnosis of celiac disease and try to increase this rate of diagnosis, especially amongst men. Now, how does someone get a diagnosis? Uh, first of all, there are patient factors. And we just mentioned that men don't go to the doctor for either uh, socio-psychological reasons or don't have symptoms. So there's the case finder. So the patient has to go to the doctor. The doctor has to think of a disease like celiac disease. For celiac disease, currently the biopsy is the gold standard, so the endoscopist has an important role. And the pathologist needs to um, confirm the diagnosis. So we've been interested in this section. So we've talked about this. Now what about the case finder? So this was a multi-centre study done in North America in primary practice settings in which they consented individuals with those unusual conditions such as bloating, depression, fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome, um, hypothyroidism. And when they identified these individuals and uh, consented them and tested for celiac disease, they increased the rate of diagnosis of celiac disease 44-fold. So um, we know that the patients are going to the doctor, but once again, the primary care doctor or the, the internist is not considering the diagnosis. I think it's interesting that, uh, at least in the United States, um, women use their gynecologist as primary care providers, and they're not internists. Um, they'll get a bone density done, start some woman on a, on a medication, not ask the question, oh, why would this young woman um, have reduced bone density? So there's the patient's got to go to the doctor, then someone's got to think of celiac disease. And we often, I heard today, uh, you know, my paediatrician said, oh, you could, your kid couldn't have celiac disease. Well, one doesn't know. One doesn't know the genetic makeup of the individual as you look at them or whether they have celiac disease just by eyeballing someone. So we've been interested in the endo endoscopic factors, being an endoscopist and getting into celiac disease via the endoscopy suite. Now, certainly the patient on the left has villus atrophy. Finding signs of uh, villus atrophy, whether it's celiac disease or something else, these endoscopic signs are, are quite specific. But this patient can also have celiac disease. So you can't just eyeball and say someone does or does not have celiac disease. Now, there are guidelines that uh, endoscopists should take four to six four to six pieces, biopsies of the duodenum, to make a diagnosis of celiac disease. And one of the reasons for this is that there are two reasons. One, it's a patchy disorder. And you can see this is just chromoendoscopy. You can see if the biopsy forceps fell there, there are no villi, but if they fall there, they get, you're going to get villi. And the other factor is the poor orientation, variable orientation, of the tissue samples. So we were interested in looking at adherence to these biopsy guidelines. What's the effect of that? And for this, we used uh, this private pathology service um, in which we were able to analyze 130,000 uh, duodenal biopsy reports. And in only 35% of cases were four or more specimens submitted. Uh, and in fact, the most frequently submitted number of specimens is two. So that's probably going down there and going bite, bite, and then getting out, right? And relatively few, sub and less than 35% of occasions were four or more submitted. However, if the guidelines were adhered to and uh, more than four or more specimens were submitted, no matter what the indication for the procedure, whether it was suspected celiac disease, reflux, weight loss, anemia, the odds ratio of getting a diagnosis of celiac disease was significantly increased 
if four or more samples were submitted. So if you're going to take biopsies, you've got to take uh, the recommended number. And in fact, there was this linear relationship between number of samples submitted and the chance of getting a diagnosis of celiac disease. I was a bit surprised by this result. Um, so overall, adherence to these guidelines was low. It did increase, but still, at the end of our study period, it was still less than 40% of people were adhering to these guidelines. But whatever the indication, adherence to the guidelines is associated with increased chance of diagnosing celiac disease. We're doing a study in our endoscopy unit, not looking at the people from the celiac centre, and noting a consistent pattern that's very interesting. It's not the age of the endoscopist, uh, his time out of training, it's other individual factors appear to be responsible for this adherence to guidelines. But it's quite clear that if you don't take any biopsies, you're not going to diagnose anyone with celiac disease. So we were interested in looking at another database. This is the CORI database. This is once again a national database that's maintained by the ASGE uh, through government funds. Um, and people from different uh, endoscopic settings, private practice, university medical centers, and VA centers report in their endoscopic findings. So we were interested in looking at those people who are having endoscopy for iron deficiency, anemia, weight loss, or diarrhea, right? You know, maybe celiac disease. And in fact, with the indication for those factors, which are possible celiac disease, only 43% of people actually had a duodenal biopsy. Uh, the biopsy rate increased, and at the end of this study period, it was still only 50% of individuals who were having an endoscopy for possible celiac disease got a biopsy. And the groups less likely to get a biopsy were non-whites, men, and when the indication was weight loss. We see it all the time. A patient's got iron deficiency anemia, they're referred for colonoscopy and get an endoscopy. They get an endoscopy, get flipped over, get the colonoscopy, and then they're out of there, and months or years later, someone thinks of celiac disease and does the blood test. So um, the patients are coming to the doctors. Now, we were also interested in looking at these databases, you know, adapting the um, information that we've learned from the colonoscopy adenoma detection rate story. Like now, when an individual comes to see a colonoscopist, they may say, you know, uh, ma'am, uh, sir, what's your adenoma detection rate? Um, because there's no reason to go to a uh, gastroenterologist who doesn't know their adenoma detection rate um, or, uh, and can't tell their patients because that's at least a gold standard in quality of colonoscopy. So we're, a, we're, we're kind of extrapolating these types of studies, and now these patients know when they go to the gastroenterologist, they say, oh, how many uh, biopsies are you going to take from the duodenum? You know, four or six. Um, so these patients are getting tough. Um, so we were interested in looking at procedure volume, once again from one of these uh, pathology databases, and Interestingly, and probably not su surprisingly, those with the greatest procedure volume had the lower uh, adherent, had a lower adherence rate. So busier docs, busier endoscopists take fewer biopsies. Surprise, surprise. Um, so uh, a higher procedure volume in this study is associated with decreased adherence to these, bio to these guidelines. Um, but what was interesting, there was increased adherence with gastroenterologists working in suites, endoscopy suites, with higher numbers of gastroenterologists. So it's um, like you know, people learning from each other probably or competing with each other. But it was not for a higher gastroenterologist density in a given zip code uh, within the country. Um, so that's kind of interesting for medical education and uh, 
like passing information on um, amongst colleagues. Um, and then uh, there'd been studies done in children about uh, in the increased yield in doing duodenal bulbar biopsies to diagnose celiac disease. So we did this prospective study in which we took duodenal bulbar biopsy and increased the yield of diagnosing celiac disease by 13%. Um, so you're supposed to do four to six biopsies in the descending duodenum and a couple from the bulb. Now David Sanders in uh, the UK did this study in which he showed that in fact it's better to, bi to biopsy at 12 o'clock in the bulb and 9 o'clock to further increase the yield of diagnosing celiac disease. Um, so we were then interested in uh, extrapolating these studies and whether there was a difference in the yield of going down and taking one bite with the biopsy forceps or two bites because like it's quicker to do two bites, but you know, one always, if you're looking, you can see a bit of the first biopsy floating off, etc. cetera. Um, so we did this study in which we um, were looking whether that factor, one or two bites per passage of the biopsy forceps, was associated with better or worse orientation. Because di to diagnose celiac disease, the pathologists should be able to have three or four cryptovillus units. And this is a typical poorly oriented biopsy. And you can rotate any biopsy and get no villi. But when you see the crypts all like little circles, um, then it's poorly oriented and you just can't assess uh, cryptovillus ratio. So for this study, we... Um, prospectively consented patients and went down and took two bites in the duodenum with one pass of the forceps in one jar and then the next jar took two bites but one biopsy per pass of the forceps. And interestingly, um, there were more pieces uh, when you take one bite per pass. Um, and there was a significantly increased percentage of oriented pieces with um, two-pass technique. And in fact, whatever you looked at, uh, so this was an obviously an enriched population of celiacs. So all patients, there was a significantly increased um, percentage of well-oriented specimens, um, as shown in the red column, uh, compared to the black box. Uh, for those with known celiac disease, getting a follow-up biopsy. For those with, with suspected celiac disease, um, those that were the controls with unknown sta status, those that had villus atrophy on the final uh, diagnosis, uh, and those that were diagnosed with celiac disease. So it's better to go down and take one biopsy per pass of the biopsy forceps. And that, this study has only ever been done in one other set of patients, and that's, in fact, ulcerative colitis patients that are being screened for dysplasia. And it was exactly the same findings. So we all go down there and take two bites all the time, but, in fact, with what the two diseases that have been looked at, that's UC for dysplasia, and in the diagnosis assessment of villus atrophy, it's better to take one piece. I know uh, Charlie Lightdale in our institution, uh, in the Barrett, in all his Barrett's work, will only take one piece per pass of the forceps. So it's an interesting and very practical point of view, and at least now we have evidence that that's the best thing to do. So there should be one bite per pass of biopsy forceps, yielding more diagnostic specimens. So I've tried to show that um, there are multiple factors responsible for this very high under-diagnosis of celiac disease. That are the patient factors, patients have to go to the doctor, uh, there are case finder factors, they have to go to the right doctor, or they have to go to a doctor that thinks about the disease. Um, 
If they have positive serologies and they're referred for endoscopy, they need to have uh, the, the right number of specimens taken by the better method from all the different sites. And then what I haven't discussed is the pathologist factors, and that's also a factor. We looked at 100 consecutive biopsies done at St. Elsewhere's uh, when the patients have come along, and uh, consistently we had a very good degree of agreement when the biopsy was originally interpreted at a university hospital pathology department, but not at a private pathology or a communi community pathology so, department. So thanks very much.